Thank you. Um, okay, so before I go and uh, do a, a bit longer introduction of myself, um, it would be helpful for me to kind of gauge who I'm going to offend in this talk. So raise your hand if you're familiar with Rust. Let's start with that. Okay, that's great. Raise your hand if you're proficient in Java. Okay, Python? All right, SQL? Pretty much what I, I had in mind, okay. Um, so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna talk about the future in this talk, um, which is always a bad idea, essentially. I can, I'm most likely will be wrong. Um, there's a saying in Hebrew that prophecy is given to the fools, um, so I'll be the fool for this talk uh, and try to give you my take of what the future might look like. Um, or at least what I believe, or maybe hope, it would look like. Um, and yeah, Rust plays a role in this, as you can probably see from the title. Um, also, to keep things interesting, I'll use a lot of kind of clickbaity titles, um, just to keep things fun. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> so, my name is Oz Katz. I'm a CDO and one of the co-founders uh, for an open source project called LakeFS. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, essentially imagine having Git running on top of your object store, right, at petabytes of data um, that you can roll back, commit, branch off of it. Uh, all the nice capabilities of Git, but on top of lots of data, essentially. Um, this puts me in a pretty unique point in like my perspective on the data landscape, um, because we're kind of a basic infrastructure. We have a lot of the different compute engines and different systems that are running on top of either LakeFS or just the object store, so we get to see a lot of everything. Um, so this is kind of my very narrow perspective of the world, what it looks like today, and what I believe it might look like in the future. Um, so speaking of that, that's before we talk about the future, maybe let's spend a few minutes talking about what it looks like nowadays. Uh, and I've gone ahead and I drew what I call kind of the modern data stack simplified. I'm assuming this is not new for a lot of you, right? You've seen images kind of similar to this in the past. Um, so just to walk through this kind of quickly, so on the left we have our organization's data stored in all kinds of different places. Um, I just noticed that I have CRM twice, so the data duplications, that's common, we all know that. Um, <laughs> So we have CRMs, ERPs, we have our operational databases. Um, we have all these different inputs uh, that we want to be able to utilize and to get value from. Um, then we have, I called it ingest, which is a pretty bad name, but a set of technologies that allow us to take some of that input data, maybe other types of input data as well, um, and bring it into some place where we can process it, store it, analyze it, extract the value from it, right? That value could be a machine learning model, uh, an AI model, or it could be just a dashboard or a report of like how many sales did we make, right, if we look at those input sources. Um, another way to kind of look at this diagram, right, if I try to add kind of what this is actually all running on, so a lot of it is based on that technology that I just claimed is dead a second ago, so obviously it's not. Um, and I guess the second part would be based on Python, which most of you raised your hands when I asked if you're familiar with. Um, so to be a really good data engineer in the present, um, if we speak those two languages, that's already a very, very good start, right? We can't escape SQL, nor do we want to, honestly. Um, and to be a very, very good data engineer, uh, we also need, um, yeah. Um, so going back to my claim, why, why am I saying that the JVM uh, is dead? So first of all, it's not really dead. It's never going to die. Um, one of the reasons is Hadoop. Some of you might know this as that obscure set of XMLs that you have to configure somewhere when things break, uh, when you're running Spark. Um, but Hadoop is probably here to stay. It's kind of a core infrastructure. Um, a lot of our different tools that we use nowadays are built on top of that layer, um, and it's kind of hard to escape. Um, so for that reason alone, like I see MapReduce in production in many organizations still, and that's a white paper from almost 20 years ago now. Um, so why am I claiming it's dead or that it's going to die? Um, so this diagram, one you see on the right, so on the y-axis we have 
CPU speeds, um, and then the x-axis is time. And, and if you look at the like, end of that spectrum, uh, it ends at 2015. That's what I could find on Google Images. Uh, I put a lot of effort into those slides, yeah. Um, it doesn't really change much after that, right? So you, none of you have a CPU that's going to 31,000 megahertz. Um, it all caps at around two, three gigahertz, five gigahertz if you pay a lot of money. Um, but the fact is CPUs are just not getting any faster. Um, Java, and more specifically the JVM, was born kind of in the middle of all of this, right? So if I had to draw a line, I would draw it around 1995. That's when Java was initially released. Um, CPUs were getting faster at the time, right? We all know Moore's law. Um, if we had a performance issue, we had basically two options, right? Either we would uh, optimize and try to find the bottleneck, measure it, iterate, solve it, or we just waited a couple of years, right? And CPUs would just double their speeds and it would be fine. Um, but this is no longer the situation, right? CPUs are just not getting any faster. And that's been true for a long time. They are getting more efficient of what they can do with those limited cycles that we do have. Um, and I'll touch back on that in a few slides. Um, so we have Moore's Law. That's one thing that's kind of working against the JVM now. Um, we also have that notorious thing called the class path. Raise your hand if you have battle stories around the class path misbehaving. Thank you. I, you're, you guys are my friends. Um, so kind of the way to distribute a Java application is essentially shipping a bunch of jars, a JRE, and your application, right? It's a set of all these things. Um, if you remember the previous slide, um, you might also have a few XMLs in there as well. Um, but that's kind of what there was in 95, right? Um, no one was talking about microservices or things that are communicating across a network all that much. Um, that came later with SOAP and other profanities. Um, we had ClassPath, right? If we wanted to utilize existing code from some other place, the only way to do that was to include its jar, um, typically in another XML file, uh, Palm XML or whatever, um, and just ship this one giant set of jars as our application. Um, and the last thing, which does kind of touch back to Moore's Law, um, is that Java is a garbage collected language. And with that, it does very efficient garbage collection nowadays. But garbage collection requires computation. And computation requires cycles of CPU. And we don't get many of those anymore, right? We're kind of capped on that. Um, so getting like top performance, extracting the most out of the CPU cycles that we do have becomes a challenge. Um, and if there are any Databricks employees in the audience, you can ask them about Photon. Uh, which is essentially rewriting uh, some of the parts of Spark um, with other languages that are not garbage collection and are not based on JVM. Um, so yeah, it will never die, but on the other hand, maybe it's not something we wanna build on for the future. Um, so I offended half of the audience, now let's offend the other half. Um, so let's talk about Python for a second. Yeah, um, so Python. So Python is a really nice DSL on top of C. Um, it essentially allows data scientists to call C functions in a way that makes sense for them, I guess would be my definition. Um, technically, you might claim that you can even run Python on the JVM, but you would never want to do that um, because everything you do in Python essentially depends on some C library somewhere. Right? And the typical workflow of getting started with a Python project would be to try and pip install something, have it yell at you that CFFI-dev is missing, putting that in Stack Overflow, copying the first answer, and there we go. Right? It all depends on that C code underlying. Um, you can't really go much further than that if you only depend on, on Python. Um, so we call it Python. Essentially, we're all dependent on CPython, which is the C implementation of the Python interpreter. Um, and it works fine as kind of that upper layer on top of C, but without C, we can't really go that far. And C is very efficient, um, but the problem with C is that it's also really hard to write, right? We have Python for a reason for doing data science. No one wants to do data science directly with C. Um, and why not? So 
reasons, right? So it, it's really hard to write good C code. I don't know if any of you have experience with that. Actually, raise your hand if you've done C before. Okay, quite a few, more than I expected. Um, so managing memory, right? Especially deallocating memory when it's time to do so. Um, avoiding null pointers uh, and, and all kinds of other weird stuff that relates to memory management is hard. Um, managing dependencies, right? So shared objects coming from your operating systems and things that are either dynamically linked or statically linked into your binary. And there is no like good package manager for C. There's operating systems. And that's not a great way to go. Um, and C++ solves some problems, but none of the ones that I just mentioned, right? It doesn't really help you with memory management. It doesn't help you manage dependencies very well. Um, it also doesn't really help you write correct code, even though that's kind of changing nowadays. Um, so C is hard and C++ is hard, and if anyone from Databricks is in the audience, you can probably ask them about Photon, um, because it's probably hard to write. Um, yeah, anyone who's writing C has probably been through threads like this before. Um, so this is what we have now, right? Our core infrastructure is based on the JVM and then C with a bit of Python on, to on top of that. Um, what would I imagine the future looks like? Um, so yeah, it, it includes Rust. No big surprise, you came to this talk, right? This slide had to come at some point. Um, so let me introduce Rust for a second for those who are not familiar with it at all. Um, so Rust is a compiled language. It's strongly typed. Uh, it's relatively new. I think 2015 was the first initial release of it. Uh, coming out of uh, Mozilla initially, but then gaining traction at bigger companies. Uh, AWS contributed quite a bit and also did some pretty impressive stuff with it. Um, Microsoft are invested in that as well now. There's parts of the Linux kernel who are now running Rust code. Um, so quite a bit of traction for a language that is still relatively a baby, right? Eight years old, if you compare that to C, which is about 50, uh, and even Java itself, which is celebrating its 30th uh, birthday soon. Um, so relatively a, a new player. Um, it does try to solve some of the issues that we talked about, specifically around like the things that make C so hard. Um, so one of the things is that it does ensure safety, or at least memory safety, right? No language is gonna keep you from writing bugs, um, but a certain class of bugs that have to do with memory management, um, and we've all heard of like heart bleed and other like security things that had to do with like how you manage memory. Um, there is a nasty class of bugs that just you completely avoid once you start using something like Rust. Um, and there is no VM. Right, so unlike Java that has this layer of like trans, like, sorry, of a, a VM that has to translate every instruction into its own like architecture that's running on top, um, Rust compiles directly to machine code that you can just run to an ELF on Linux or to whatever format you know, is suited to the operating system that it runs on. Um, the Rust compiler itself, for those familiar, is just a front end for LLVM, right? So we actually write something that compiles directly to something that your computer can run. Um, so this allows us to extract probably the theoretical maximum out of whatever CPU cycles we do have. Um, and because this is not based on some VM, um, it also allows us to utilize whatever capabilities our CPUs have. Right, so if we talk about analytics, one of the key capabilities um, is something called vectorized execution, right, or SIMD for those familiar, familiar with CPUs, um, which essentially mean that for a given CPU cycle, we can do more than one computation. We can, for example, multiply a set of integers and not just one pair. Um, Java has limited support for that as an API. Uh, the JIT compiler does uh, try to optimize for that in some cases. With Rust, because it's relatively low level, or at least compared to Java, it's something that's not running directly on a VM, it's actually running on our hardware, we can actually call, like whatever is on our CPU, get the most out of it because we can actually call those functions. Um, so we get the efficiency, we get the memory safety aspect of it, uh, and we also get a small binary, right? So if you remember uh, our class path, 
uh, our set of jars. Um, we don't have that anymore. We compile a binary. Um, it's relatively small in size because we don't need a virtual machine for it. Um, so it's also pretty easy to ship. Um, yeah, I tried to draw memory correctness. I failed miserably, so sorry. Um, okay, a another key element that is probably very important when we talk about analytics is Rust's ability to interoperate, right? So we know that, like from the Python example, um, systems usually don't run in isolation. Like they depend on other libraries to do some of the work. Um, Rust has great support for interoperability. Right, so it has something called FFI, which is Foreign Function Interface. Um, if you're familiar with Python errors, you've probably seen that word somewhere. Um, FFI essentially lets Rust interoperate with C code. Right, so if we have existing libraries already built and optimized and tested um, that are built with C, uh, we can natively, almost natively call them. Right, it's a very thin layer on top of that. Um, Additionally, and this is something that if you guys are, anyone using Delta RS or heard of Delta RS? Okay, quite a few. Um, so it's called Delta RS, yet most of us use it using Python. Um, the reason for that is this nice library called PyO3, um, which essentially lets you wrap using Python uh, existing Rust code, right? So Delta RS, all the logic is written in Rust. It's very efficient, it's very fast. It's able to utilize the maximum out of your machine um, but we get a nice Python API that humans or data scientists, I don't know if these two groups are completely overlapping, um, but they can actually use it uh, with a nice interface. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and maybe I want to expand on that a bit, um, is WebAssembly. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, so looking at what's out there now, and this is just a small subset of the kind of budding ecosystem that's being built around Rust. Um, so I give a few examples of libraries that you're free to go and look at at your own free time, but on the right is kind of the, I guess, uh, the stars of the show, at least for now. Um, so we have Polars, which is essentially a data frame API, pretty similar to Pandas for those familiar with it, uh, a bit of a different take. It's based on Rust, it's also uh, wrapped with Python, so for data science work, uh, it's pretty interesting and the performance is really impressive. Um, there's uh, Delta RS, which we talked about briefly, and then the middle three uh, are all projects that are related to Apache Arrow. Um, Apache Arrow, for those who are not familiar, is a set of libraries and utilities for many different languages, by the way, not just Rust, um, that have to do with how we model, how we serialize um, columnar data. That sounds pretty boring, but the fact is that this is a pre, pretty core capability. Uh, any system that supports the arrow format allows you to, without any cost almost, move from one system to another. Right? So I can load something using pandas, and because this is an arrow data frame, I can convert it immediately to a DuckDB database or a table. Um, as long as it speaks that arrow language, um, and this is an in-memory representation, right? So within the same process, I can make those switches. Um, they all talk that same language, that arrow, that they all adhere to that arrow specification, um, and then they can just interop with one another. Um, so there's arrow, which is kind of the base protocol, that's memory representation, and then there's a set of libraries on top of that. So there is data fusion, which is kind of like a data warehouse on top of that. It allows us to do computations. There's Ballistra, which is an actual like, distributed compute framework based on arrow. Um, there's an RPC protocol called Aero Flight, which allows us to take a data frame and ship it to another machine uh, in a pretty efficient manner. Um, all of these are based on that same ecosystem, and Rust is kind of a key player there. So there's support for a lot of different languages. Not all languages have all the different capabilities that Aero provides. Rust has a pretty serious, I, I would say probably the most support out of all languages uh, for Aero. Um, so going back for a second, let, let's talk about WebAssembly. Uh, it's probably gonna be uh, important we, that we understand this for the next slides. So what is WebAssembly for those who are not familiar? So essentially it's a specification for a virtual machine. Um, and it's one that's designed to be performant but also very, very portable, right? So 
if you have a web browser from the last few years, you're probably capable of running WebAssembly code and you might have already done so without you knowing. Um, essentially, it's another target that we can compile to. Right? Just like we can compile to Java bytecode, we can compile to WebAssembly bytecode. Um, and we can do that from many different languages, um, Rust being, of course, one of them. Um, but once we compile something to WebAssembly, we can essentially run it on many different types of architecture, whether it's on the server, it's on the client, um, on thin devices. It's meant to be very, very efficient and very, very small in nature because we want to get that capability of being able to run something everywhere. Um, so this is an example actually from the project that I'm working on from LakeFS. Um, so in LakeFS, we embedded uh, DuckDB, which is coincidentally not written in Rust. It's written in C++, I believe. Um, but it does compile to WebAssembly. Um, and so here is an example of running an analytical query, all fully in the browser. Right? So all the compute that was used for, in this case, it's a very small, like, simple query, but this could be multi-tables joining and like aggregations. And it would do so very efficiently using the CPU power that I have here on, on my machine, right? So nothing is actually executed on the server to satisfy this, right? Imagine turning your browser into a data warehouse. And that's kind of the core strength of WebAssembly. Um, so for those of you who've been around long enough, this might sound familiar, right? The concept of being able to write something once and then execute it anywhere. Um, I actually found this screenshot. It took a bit of digging. So this is from the Java installer, I think probably around 97, maybe a bit later. Actually, it says Blu-ray, so much later, but it looks like it's really old. Um, so yeah, you can run Java anywhere on your Blu-ray disc player and your set-top box, which you all obviously have nowadays. Uh, and even in your car, and I'm just trying to imagine a self-driving car doing a garbage collection pause for a few seconds. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Back to Rust. So um, we talked about WebAssembly and being the target that's meant to be very, very portable and very small. So Rust is actually a great fit for compiling to WebAssembly because there is no VM, right? And the, we can probably get away with compiling Java code uh, to WebAssembly, but that would require also compiling the Java virtual machine to run on top of the WebAssembly virtual machine. I don't know if anyone tried that. Could be an interesting experiment, probably not going to work very well. Um, but Rust is very suitable for that. You get a very small binary um, that's running directly on your instruction set, in our case, WebAssembly. Um, and that example that I showed you in the Lake of SUI, it's probably only a couple of megabytes to load that binary for the browser. Um, and that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, that's something that I, as a user, can wait for and not see like a progress bar running for a long time. Um, so Rust enables that, and the fact that it is strongly typed and the fact that it does have a lot of the same kind of types and traits that compiled languages have makes it very relatively easy to compile to WebAssembly. Um, so yeah, we, we don't have the garbage collection pauses, right? So this maps wonderfully to thin clients and to things that are relatively, like, without that much CPU. Um, we don't have the runtime, so the deployment is very quick, right? whether it's on the server or on the client. Um, and we get that nice ecosystem that we saw before, right? with Apache Arrow and Polars and all the, those other nice systems that are already implemented on Rust. And we can have the same logic running from the beginning of our pipeline all the way to the client side as well, right? using the same tools, the same technologies, um, maybe actually fulfilling the dream of writing once and then running anywhere. Um, so bear with me as I try to imagine kind of the future data stack, the post-modern -post data stack. I don't know, I'm making up terms. Um, I would imagine something kind of like this. So ignore the fact that Red Panda's logo is very big. It's just because it's so cute and I like it. Um, so this is something that I would imagine. Okay, so try and think together with me. So we have on our left side all our operational systems, right? Um, I don't know if anyone had the opportunity or pleasure of trying to extract data from something like Salesforce. Um, I hear the laughs, okay. 
Um, it's not always that easy. Um, it's usually kind of tricky to get the data out of there. Um, it might change its schema from time to time and break things that are downstream from it. Um, what if we can run our logic directly inside Salesforce, right? Only send me this data when a new opportunity arrives. Um, we could write it in a few lines of Rust or almost any other language that compiles to WebAssembly and just ship it to Salesforce and have them run that very small WebAssembly binary whenever there is a new opportunity in our Salesforce. Um, what if we could also do it on our operational database? Right? So we all know like SQL triggers, right? On inserts, do blah, blah, blah in PL SQL or some other fun language. Um, what if we could just bring our own language, right? What if we could just write Rust or Python or whatever we want and have it just executed on the operational database? Probably on the replica, I hope. Um, but ha giving us the ability to actually control the, the logic all the way back to the data source itself, right? And then we know we're only getting the data as we expected it to be um, into an ingest system that is also capable of that same thing, right? So in this case, it's Red Panda, which is a kind of a streaming log abstraction, pretty similar to Kafka. I think that it's even API compatible with Kafka. And it actually, even today, allows you to inject a WebAssembly binary uh, to process incoming messages. Right, so I can write a small program to do stuff like validations, transformations, enrichment, um, in pretty much any language I would like. I just ship them a WASM binary, um, they load it up, and it starts running for every message. Right? And I could even reuse some of the logic that I use in those original data sources. Right? I can share code between all of these components because I'm free to bring whatever architecture and runtime that I want. Um, and then we have our processing and storage layer, uh, right, where we do the actual heavy lifting. We got all the data into our data lake or our lake house. Um, now we want to do something interesting with it. Uh, and this is where efficiency comes into play, right? Here we want to be able to extract every small bit of CPU that we can. Um, so here you see a lot of crabs. That's the Rust logo, which is also pretty cute. Um, so imagine we have all these components, all of them being able to speak that language that we talked about, right, arrow. Um, so I could load something using Delta RS, convert it to a Polar's data frame, because they both support the arrow protocol, do some transformation there. If that's not good enough and I want to spin up something distributed, I can go to something like Ballistra, um, which would let me do kind of parallel uh, uh, distributed uh, computation on top of that. Um, and then maybe one day also run Wasm on top of Spark. Um, maybe that's something we can wish for. Um, there is actually a, a white paper by someone at MIT whose name I don't remember. I'll, I'll show you links in a second. Um, who kind of delved into writing Spark UDFs using WebAssembly, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then eventually we want to do what we call like last mile analytics, right? We want that small kind of selective queries that a client might want to do. That could be our reporting dashboard, right? We're playing with a dropdown, selecting different values. Um, we can do that fully on the client side, right? So if you have everything already pre-aggregated and computed efficiently, um, what if we can run like those small bits uh, of, of queries directly on the client's machine? Right, so if we talk about client machines nowadays, like this is not a very strong laptop and I think it has probably like 10 or 12 cores. Um, we might not be getting faster CPUs, but we are getting more cores out of them and we are able to do more per cycle. Um, so imagine having that last mile also be with WebAssembly, um, maybe even with the same logic that we use for those transformation layers, being able to run directly on the client's machine. Um, I even foresee a future where we have not just data on our object stores, but actually a CDN in front of it. Right? So our parquet files actually end up pretty close to the users, in which case we can actually do very interesting queries directly from the client side using these protocols. Um, and then, of course, I had to leave this. This is never going to go away. The JVM will die before Excel will. Um, and I don't see Excel running WebAssembly anytime soon, but if anyone wants to write a very interesting open source project, I'd be happy to see that. Um, 
Yeah, so here are a few links. I'll leave this for a second if you guys want to uh, grab them. So in the middle, at the bottom, there's that Spark Wasm UDF uh, paper, which is pretty interesting, and I hope something like this does happen one day. Um, additionally, there is Photon from Databricks, which I think is also worth kind of looking into, especially the reasoning behind it and why it exists. Um, and yeah, with that, this is all stuff you can just take today and start adopting and looking at. Uh, and I hope you find this talk interesting. So thank you. <laughs>